Trade Coffee believes that anyone can make great coffee at home. All you need is access to the best beans roasted to order and curated for your personal taste, which is exactly what they provide. Thanks to their in-house team of coffee experts, over 50 small batch specialty coffee partners, and over 450 rotating roasts from dark roast to decafs, espressos to cold brews and iced coffee, you can discover the best coffee suited to your taste. And it's not too early to begin thinking of the perfect gift for mom and dad, graduates, or your best friend getting married this season. Whether it's for yourself or a gift to a loved one, you can't go wrong with better coffee. Right now, I am loving the Good Citizen Coffee. It is a light roast with notes of milk chocolate and black cherry, and it's even roasted in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. So if you love coffee as much as I do, you need to try Trade Coffee today. For a limited time, enjoy a free bag and up to $15 off select plans when you visit my link drinktrade.com slash killer that's drinktrade.com slash killer for a free bag and up to $15 off select plans drinktrade.com slash killer you guys, I have said it before, but I will say it again. 2024 is the year of health for me, and that includes making sure I stay hydrated. So whether you hydrate to live or live to hydrate, Liquid IV quenches your thirst faster than water alone with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness all in one single sugar-free stick. Sometimes drinking regular water over and over again just gets a little boring, but Liquid IV makes staying hydrated a more fun and enjoyable experience. I personally look forward to drinking my favorite flavor, which is green grape, by the way, every single day. Not only is the flavor amazing, but it does the perfect job of quenching my thirst with the crisp taste. Whether I take liquid IV after a long night out or after my workout, I'm always certain that I'll feel hydrated and satisfied. With liquid IV, there are no artificial sweeteners and there's zero sugar. It's non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. And one one stick and 16 ounces of water hydrates you better than just water alone. So however you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV Hydration Multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code KILLER at checkout. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code KILLER at liquidiv.com. Hello, you guys. What's up? Welcome back to another episode of Killer Instinct. Thank you guys so much for joining me here today. If you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah and I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Before we get started, make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly here on the podcast every single Wednesday and you are not going to want to miss it. We also post the video version onto YouTube on Wednesdays as well. So make sure you are subscribed. Now, you guys, Happy April. We are in a brand new month. And if you've been keeping up, you would know that that means we are in a brand new true crime category. For the past few months, we have been dedicating each month to a different true crime category. January was unsolved cases. February was killer couples. March was celebrity cases. And now we are in April. And the category for April is, drum roll please, serial killers. I asked you guys on the Killer Instinct Instagram page, which if you do not follow it, make sure you are. It is just at Killer Instinct Podcast. I asked you guys over there which category you would like to see for April, and I got an overwhelming response of serial killer requests. That was hands down, without a doubt, the most popular request. So that is what we are dedicating April to. We are going to be discussing all things serial killers. And if you have a specific serial killer in mind that you would like to hear about this month, make sure you drop it in the comments below or shoot me a DM on the Killer Instinct Instagram page. So as you can tell by the title of today's episode, today we are starting off the serial killer 
cases with none other than someone who has been coined the meanest man in America. Today we are talking about Donald Gaskins. Donald has self-proclaimed his victim count to be over 100 victims. However, only 15 of those have been confirmed and there is absolutely no way that we could get into today's episode without putting out a massive trigger warning. I have been doing this for quite some time. We have done well over 250 episodes here on Killer Instinct, and even me, myself, this one was very hard to get through. In this episode, we are going to be talking about sexual assault, not just sexual assault, but sexual assault on minors as well. We are going to be talking about torture. There is a lot going on in this episode today. So if any of that is too overwhelming for you, please just exit out of the episode now. We will see you next week. But for those who want to stick around and learn about the meanest man in America, let's jump right on into it today. Donald Gaff Gaskins was born on March 13, 1933, in South Carolina to his parents, Donald and Yulia. Now, from a very young age, Donald was always a little smaller in stature. He stood at about five foot four, and this is what led him to be given the name Pee Wee Gaskins. That is probably, if you have heard of Donald before, that is the name you might have heard of him by. Now, Donald had the furthest thing from a good childhood. Donald's mom had him when she was only 15 years old, and it was said that she had consistently neglected him all throughout his life. When Donald was one year old, he ended up drinking a bottle of kerosene, which is extremely poisonous. If you don't know, kerosene is what's most often used as fuel jet. It's also used in different cooking and cleaning supplies. So all in all, it is just definitely not something that you would want to swallow. However, he drank an entire bottle of it as a result of the neglect that he was receiving by his mother. And because of this, the result was that he had convulsions for the next two years. Now, growing up, Donald experienced a lot of abuse at the hands of his mother's boyfriends. Each boyfriend that she would have would come in and abuse Donald in some way, whether that was verbally or physically. He was always being abused or neglected. It was even said that the neglect was so bad that Donald didn't know what his own first name was until the first time he ended up in court and he heard it, because that is how bad the neglect was. That is how little he got paid attention to. That is how little he had been spoken to. He didn't even know his first name. Now, when Donald was 11 years old, he ended up dropping out of school to work at a local auto body shop, and that is where he met two other boys named Danny and Marsh. Now, Danny, Marsh, and Donald were all around the same age and not in school, so they spent the majority of their time getting themselves into trouble, so much so that they called themselves the Trouble Trio. The three of them spent their time robbing homes, mugging people, and picking up local sex workers. It wasn't until Donald was 13 years old where he was convicted of assault after the Trouble Trio was caught breaking into a home and ran into a young woman who lived there. As a result, Donald hit this young woman over the head with an axe and left her to die. Now, luckily, the young woman was able to survive the incident, However, she did identify Donald as being the one who attacked her, and he was found guilty of assault with a deadly weapon and intent to kill, and was sent to juvie on June 18, 1946, where he remained until he was 18 years old. Now, Donald's time at juvie was no walk in the park either. During his time being incarcerated, he was repeatedly raped by other inmates. He did try to escape several times. However, he was caught every single time up until the last time where he actually was successful in escaping. Now, this initial escape was quite bizarre. Donald escaped juvie and was out on his own, going back to his old ways. He was robbing people, mugging people, and he also began dating dating a 13-year-old girl at this time. Now, shortly after he escaped and was dating this girl, he ended up going back to juvie and turning himself in to finish out the rest of his sentence, and then he was released on his 18th birthday.
day. Now, after getting released, Donald started working at a local tobacco farm, but he was also running this little side business where he would steal things from the farm, steal tobacco from the farm, and sell it on the side. That way he could completely pocket that money. He also began collaborating with local tobacco farmers and offered to burn their barns down for insurance money. He would require a flat fee from these farmers and then would require payment afterwards, and he was able to do this for quite some time. However, in 1953, Donald hit his boss's daughter over the head with a hammer and split her skull open after she began questioning him about the barn fires. It seemed like she might have caught on to his little side business and what he was doing, and when she questioned him about it, that is when he attacked her. So because of this, he was sentenced to six years in prison at the South Carolina Penitentiary. Now, while he was incarcerated, Donald spent a lot of time being sexually assaulted and raped by fellow inmates, and he decided that in order to gain the respect of everyone around him, in order to place fear in his fellow inmates, he was going to have to do something drastic. And what he ended up doing was killing the most feared man in prison. He ended up slitting this man's throat and leaving him to die. However, obviously there were consequences for this action. So because of this, he got convicted of manslaughter and spent six months in solitary confinement and had an additional three years added on to his sentence. Now, regardless of this, he was able to escape from prison successfully in 1955 after he hid in the back of a garbage truck, hopped on, and then went straight to Florida. Now, once he got to Florida, he started traveling around city to city with a local carnival. However, after some time, the police were able to track him down and he was rearrested, remanded back into custody. However, later released again in August of 1961 and returned back to South Carolina. Now, after getting released from prison, Donald really wasted no time in getting back into trouble. He spent a lot of time burglarizing homes. However, he was able to get away from getting caught from a lot of this because he was working for a traveling minister at the time as his driver and assistant. So he was able to drive around to all of these different towns and rob these homes and then get back in the car and drive away because he was going to a different town or out of state. So he was spending a lot of time just not getting caught for what he was was doing. However, two years after his release, he was arrested again for the rape of a 12-year-old girl and sentenced to eight years in prison, and then was released again in 1968 and moved to a town called Sumter, South Carolina, and began working for a roofing company. Now, Sumter was a small town. It was an everyone-knows-everyone type of community, and while Donald was attempting to show everyone and put the facade on that he was changing his ways and moving forward with his life, behind the curtain, Donald was still the same as he had always been. While he did work for the roofing company, he also spent his time on the weekends refurbishing stolen cars and reselling them. He rented a small place out in the countryside from a married couple and paid them $25 a month in addition to helping them maintain their farm. And he used the barn on the property to do a lot of repairs on these cars. So now let's get into the murders. And it's important to understand that with Donald, he separated his murders into two different categories. He had coastal killings, and then he had more personal killings. Those were the categories. Now the coastal killings referred to the hitchhikers that Donald would pick up. We're looking at the time frame of the 1970s. Hitchhiking was a very popular thing to do at the time. And Donald spent a lot of time luring hitchhikers into his car before murdering them. So when Donald talks about coastal kills, that is what he's referring to because he's driving along the coast, he's picking up these hitchhikers, and then he's brutally murdering them. And then the other category of the personal kills is obviously the people that Donald knew on more of a personal level. He had more of a personal relationship with them. So those are going to be the two categories that we're looking at as we continue on into this case. Now, there isn't as much information out there there as far as details go in regards to Donald's coastal kills. However, I was able to read his autobiography. I felt like it was important in order for me to really understand Donald as far as the information
information goes, obviously not understand him on an emotional or personal level because that would never happen. However, understanding the information and really getting as much information as I possibly could. So that is why I went to the autobiography and was able to get a lot of information as far as the coastal killings that he committed and how he described those. So when it comes to the coastal kills, he goes into great depth in that autobiography about them. So that is where we're going to start. And the first one that we are going to start with was in September of 1969. In September 1969, Donald was driving from Sumter, South Carolina to Myrtle Beach. And while he was on his way, Donald passed a woman who was hitchhiking. Now, Donald said that the woman looked to be about 18 or 19 years old. She was blonde. She was tan. She was attractive. And Donald pulled over to the side of the road and asked where she was heading. Now, according to Donald, the woman told him that she was going to Charleston to meet some friends. Donald told her that he wasn't planning on driving that far out. However, if that meant that he got to drive with her and once they got to Charleston, they could go to dinner together and maybe rent a hotel room for the night, he would be willing to do it. Now, according to Donald, he claims that the woman had gotten into his car before that conversation was happening. So he pulls over, she jumps in, they start start driving. He asks, where are we going? She says, Charleston. He says, I'll continue driving if that means we get to spend the night together. And that is when the woman kind of laughed it off and said that she wasn't interested and that it was no hard feelings, but just pull over and that she would get out of the car. Donald claimed he told the woman no hard feelings, that he understood, and that he would let her out. So he continued driving several miles until there was a dirt road that he could pull off to. And when he did, he claimed that he was sitting there and looked at the woman and this feeling overcame him. There was an overwhelming feeling that he had, and this feeling was that he needed to kill her. And according to Donald, he said that once he decided on killing her, he realized that he could do anything he wanted to this woman. And to him, it wasn't going to matter because she was going to die anyways. It wasn't like she was going to be able to tell anyone. It wasn't like she was going to be able to say anything about it. She was going to be dead. So it gave him free reign to do absolutely anything he wanted to her. Donald said that once this feeling and this thought of killing her was in his mind, there was no going back. He said the minute that thought popped into his head, he knew that that was what was going to happen. Donald claimed that once he pulled over onto the dirt road, the woman reached into the back seat to grab her duffel bag. However, instead, Donald slammed his fist into the side of her head and then knocked her face against the dashboard. He did this twice more before she fell unconscious and onto the floorboard of the car. Donald claimed that he then took off her belt and used it to tie her hand hands behind her back and then used his belt to loop around her neck. Donald said he then drove down the dirt road for about a quarter mile until he reached a dead end. At this point, the woman began coming back into consciousness and Donald claimed that he parked the car, got out, went over to the passenger side and pulled her out of the car from the belt around her neck. He claimed that every time she let out a scream, he would pull the belt, causing her to choke. Donald then removed all of her clothing, forced her to give him oral sex before laying her on her back and pulling on her nipple so hard that part of it actually ripped off of her body. Afterwards, he forced her to chew and swallow it. Afterwards, he got up, stomped on her pelvis as hard as he could, and then repeatedly sodomized her. Afterwards, he placed her in the trunk of his car and drove to a nearby swamp. He then pulled her out of the trunk, rolled her onto her stomach, Stomach, removed his belt from her wrists and then replaced the belt with clotheslines and then stuffed her underwear into her mouth. He then tied her knees together and tied it so that her knees were up to her chin. And then he took an 11 inch knife and raped her with it before slicing her open. He then tied her to a tree stump and dropped her body into the swamp until she sank. 
Donald then went back into his car to clean up the crime scene and searched through the woman's duffel bag where he found $300, an ID from Massachusetts, and according to him, he claimed that he didn't fully remember the name of this victim. However, it was something along the lines of Lila or Leela. Donald claimed that he kept the cash but threw the duffel bag into the swamp, and then he got back into his car, started it, and began his drive back to Sumter, South Carolina. Donald claimed that by Christmas of 1969, he had killed his first three victims, and those first three were what he called his, again, those coastal kills. Now, like I mentioned in the beginning, Donald claimed to have killed up to 110 victims. However, not all of them have been confirmed. In fact, most of them have not been confirmed. Now, he did give some contradicting statements in his book, which I think is important to point out. At one portion of the book, he claimed that he committed a coastal kill every six weeks. However, later on in the book, he claimed that he committed a coastal kill on the 10th of each month. So his statements were varying, and a lot of people have a hard time believing what Donald was saying in this autobiography because they have a tendency to believe that Donald was more so bragging about these kills and that he actually just got some sick and twisted enjoyment about writing about these kills and that he didn't actually commit them at least all of them. He obviously committed some of them. However, some of these coastal kills, which haven't been confirmed, some people have a hard time believing what Donald was saying. Now, there were no witnesses, again, to these coastal kills because a lot of these victims were drifters or hitchhikers. They were used to floating around from place to place. However, some of them were, in fact, missing persons. Now, there were no victims for any of these coastal killings, really. And because a lot of these victims were drifters and they were used to floating around, from place to place. Some of them didn't have any missing persons reports filed on them, so things get a little bit complicated when trying to confirm how many victims Donald actually has. Now, Donald's first personal kill was the murder of 15-year-old Janice Kirby and her 17-year-old friend, Patricia Alsbrook, and Janice was actually Donald's very own niece. Donald would see his family most weekends. He stated in his autobiography that he would go to the drive-in for a burger on the weekends, and that's where he would see Janice, his niece. Janice and her friends would often ask Donald to get beer or drinks for them, and he would do it. He stated that he actually enjoyed having them need something from him and them having to ask for it. It was something that he actually enjoyed hearing. In November of 1970, Janice and Patricia were drinking one night, and that is when they pulled up to Donald's mobile home. Donald had his house out in the countryside, which was more secluded. However, he also had a mobile home that was more in town as well, and that is where he was. So Patricia had pulled up in her car to the mobile home with Janice and told Donald that Janice had been drinking a lot. She was still pretty intoxicated, and Patricia was already past her curfew. So she asked Donald if Janice could stay with her until she sobered up a little bit and if Donald could take Patricia home. And Donald agreed to do so. He said, of course, and Patricia and Janice got into the back seat of his car. Now, while in the back seat, Donald said that Janice began throwing up, which was when Donald suggested that they need to go back to his house to take a cold shower and sober up. Now, Patricia agreed to this. However, it's believed that she was under the impression that they were going to go back to Donald's mobile home. However, instead, he began driving out to Sumter, which was where his country house was. Now, Patricia seemed hesitant, but went along with everything. And when the three of them arrived to the house, they brought Janice inside and put her into the shower. Afterwards, they moved into Donald's bedroom, where he told them that he had dry clothes for them to change into. Now, when they got into the room, Janice got into the bed in an attempt to sleep off the intoxication. Once in bed was when Patricia turned around and Donald had completely gotten undressed. Now, when seeing this, Patricia ran straight for the door. However, that is when Donald took out his knife and told her to sit on the bed. Patricia followed his instructions, and that is when he began making advances at Janice, who was still passed out at the time. Now, while doing this, he must not have been paying attention because that is when Patricia hit him over the head and he passed out for a few minutes. When he 
got back into consciousness, both girls, Janice and Patricia, were gone. Donald immediately grabbed his gun and ran outside, and that is when he saw that the girls were running down the dirt road, and that is when he got into his car and drove after them. They ran into the woods, and he got out of the car, fired a shot into the air, and demanded them to stop, which they did. He put them both in the trunk of his car and drove back to the house. He got both of them out and back inside, and there was definitely a struggle between the three of them. The girls did put up a fight. However, ultimately, Donald beat them until they were unconscious. He then took Patricia to an abandoned house nearby and placed her into a septic tank. And then when he got home for Janice, he took her body and buried her in a shallow grave behind the barn on the property. Now, once everyone started to notice, that Janice and Patricia were missing, people did start to look to Donald because Patricia and Janice's friends knew that he was last seen with them. Now, when questions did start to arise, Donald told everyone that Janice and Patricia wanted to run away. They were talking about running away to California. He claimed that the three of them went to the drive-in burger joint that night, and while they were there, there was a group of guys that rolled up in a car, and Janice and Patricia got into the car with them and ran off to California. That was the story that he was telling everyone, and the family was very upset about the girl's disappearance, but over time, the police basically chalked it up to them being runaways, and that was that. There was really no solid evidence that anything else had gone on or that anything else had happened, but also, people weren't really looking into Donald. No one was really questioning him. Him saying that they were runaways was really good enough for police to just continue on and look the other way. Trade Coffee believes that anyone can make great coffee at home. All you need is access to the best beans roasted to order and curated for your personal taste, which is exactly what they provide. Thanks to their in-house team of coffee experts, over 50 small batch specialty coffee partners, and over 450 rotating roasts from dark roast to decafs, espressos to cold brews and iced coffee, you can discover the best coffee suited to your taste. And it's not too early to begin thinking of the perfect gift for mom and dad, graduates, or your best friend getting married this season. Whether it's for yourself or a gift to a loved one, you can't go wrong with better coffee. Right now, I am loving the Good Citizen Coffee. It is a light roast with notes of milk chocolate and black cherry, and it's even roasted in my hometown of Nashville, Tennessee. So if you love coffee as much as I do, you need to try Trade Coffee today. For a limited time, enjoy a free bag and up to $15 off select plans when you visit my link, drinktrade.com. Slash killer. That's drinktrade.com slash killer for a free bag and up to $15 off select plans. Drinktrade.com slash killer. You guys, I have said it before, but I will say it again. 2024 is the year of health for me, and that includes making sure I stay hydrated. So whether you hydrate to live or live to hydrate, Liquid IV quenches your thirst faster than water alone with three times the electrolytes of the leading sports drink, plus eight vitamins and nutrients for everyday wellness all in one single sugar-free stick. Sometimes drinking regular water over and over again just gets a little boring, but Liquid IV makes staying hydrated a more fun and enjoyable experience. I personally look forward to drinking my favorite flavor, which is green grape, by the way, every single day. Not only is the flavor amazing, but it does the perfect job of quenching my thirst with the crisp taste. Whether I take Liquid IV after a long night out or after my workout, I'm always certain that I'll feel hydrated and satisfied. With Liquid IV, there are no artificial sweeteners and there's zero sugar. It's non-GMO and free from gluten, dairy, and soy. And one stick and 16 ounces of water hydrates you better than just water alone. So however you hydrate, grab your Liquid IV hydration multiplier sugar-free in bulk nationwide at Costco, or you can get 20% off your first order when you go to liquidiv.com and use code KILLER at checkout. Out. That's 20% off your first order when you shop Better Hydration today using promo code KILLER at liquidiv.com.
Now, in 1971, Donald began working for a used car company called Kolb's, where he rebuilt old cars. And this was actually perfect for him because it gave him a space to continue working on his side business, which was refurbishing stolen cars and then reselling them. So now he had a place to do that. 1971 is also the year that Donald claims that he committed 11 coastal kills. He claims that the torture that he made his victims suffer included burning them, cutting them, sawing sodomizing them, raping them, and even filling one of them up with water until it came out of her nose and mouth and she immediately died. Now, this would be the same year that Donald murdered a woman named Martha Ann Clyde Dix. Now, according to Donald, he claimed that Martha used to come around the auto shop and hang around. And over time, him and Martha developed a little bit of a friends with benefits type of relationship. Now, Martha was bisexual, which wasn't something that was widely accepted or noticed back then. But up until seeing Donald, Martha dated mainly women. Now, according to Donald, he said that Martha would come around the auto shop and would hang around with the other guys there and would make jokes about her and Donald's sex life to these other men. And while it started out as innocent fun in the beginning, over time, it did start to get under Donald's skin a little bit. As the weeks went by, Donald and Martha ended up getting into a pretty big argument after Martha returned to the auto shop and told everyone that she was pregnant and Donald was the father. Now, at that point, Donald claimed that he had reached his limit with Martha. He did not believe that he was the father of her child and claimed that he told Martha on this day that him and her needed to talk. So he asked her to stick around after the auto shop closed and wait till everyone left so the two of them were able to have a conversation privately. Now, Martha agreed to do this, and once everyone left, her and Donald got into his car and drove out to his country house. Now, once they got inside the home, Donald went and grabbed a bottle of pills that he had, and according to him, these pills were from all of his other coastal killings. A lot of them did have pills on them, so he would collect these pills over time, and according to Donald, once he got into the home, he went and grabbed the bottle of pills pills, restrained Martha, and took a handful of these pills and shoved them down her throat and made her drink beer in order to wash them down. Now, according to Donald, he claimed that he didn't know what these pills were, and at this point, he wasn't trying to kill Martha. He just wanted to get it to the point where Martha wasn't going to put up much of a fight. He wanted to make her weak. He wanted to make her tired and sleepy. He just did not want her to be able to put up a fight, and once that point happened, he put Martha on the bed and rolled her onto her stomach and handcuffed her. Now, at this point, Martha shot up and tried to fight Donald, but instead he punched her square in the face and kicked her in the jaw. He then took the remainder of the pills and shoved them in her mouth and made her swallow them while also, again, washing them down with a beer. Now, it did not take long for Martha to become unconscious, and that is when Donald picked her up, put her in the back of his car, and drove her out to a ditch where he disposed of of her body and her belongings. In October 1971, Donald committed another coastal killing to a woman named Anne Colberson. Anne was from Georgia, but had come out to Myrtle Beach to spend time with her friends and then decided to hitchhike back to Atlanta. And Donald's car was the one that she got into. Now, according to Donald, he claimed that Anne was very nice to him. When she got in the car, she told Donald that she was only 16 years old and that her boyfriend was 17 and he played football. She had a lot of family in Atlanta. She kind of gave Donald the backstory on herself and the two were able to have a very good conversation and Donald repeatedly said that he enjoyed how nice Anne was to him. Now, once Donald got off the highway and started taking back roads, this is when Anne began to question things. She started to ask Donald where they were going, what roads he was taking, but Donald told her not to worry and that he knew of a shortcut, but instead, Donald drove Anne out to his house in the country. Now, once Donald got there, he pulled out a gun and forced Anne to go inside. Now, unlike his previous murders, Donald kept Anne alive for four days, torturing her and raping
raping her. Donald claimed that after the four days, he knocked Anne unconscious and then dug a shallow grave before slitting her throat and disposing of her remains. Now, after killing Anne, this is when Donald began getting a little bit paranoid. He started to worry that sooner or later, the police were going to catch on to him and realize what he had been doing. So he decided that it was time to move. He wanted to get out of town. He had been killing people for quite some time, burying them on his property, burying them around Sumter. And he was worried that sooner or later, someone was going to catch on. So he decided that he was going to move to Charleston. Now, Donald knew a few people in Charleston and he had visited before and enjoyed it. So that is why he decided to move there. He also liked that it was more of a city vibe and wasn't as much of the small country feel like he was used to. So he moved to Charleston in 1972 and got a job with a construction company called Pickett Construction, but also worked part-time in different auto garage spaces. So that way he was able to continue refurbishing stolen cars as well. Now, alongside the big city feel and him just liking Charleston in general, Donald claimed that the real reason that he chose to move to Charleston was so that he could live close to the coastal roads to commit his coastal kills. In 1972, Donald claimed that he killed Eddie Brown and his wife, Birdie. Eddie was an ex-con who was in the business of buying and selling stolen firearms. He met Donald through a friend that Donald worked with in the stolen car business, and when the two met, Donald said that they hit it off, and Donald also started getting involved with the stolen firearms business. Now, over time, Eddie asked Donald if Donald would be willing to purchase some stolen firearms for him and then give them to Eddie and Eddie would pay him back. And Donald agreed to do this. However, he also told Eddie that he was too worried about passing these guns off in a big town like Charleston. So he told Eddie to meet him in Sumter in his country house and they could pass off the guns there instead. Now, Eddie agreed to this and him and his wife, Bertie, drove out to Sumter where Donald's country house was. And Donald told them that the guns were in the barn and that the three of them should walk over there, which they did. When they got to the barn, what Bertie and Eddie did not know is that Donald had an automatic rifle hiding inside of the door of the barn. Once they got inside the barn, Donald picked up the rifle and opened fired onto Eddie and Bertie. Now, Eddie died almost immediately. However, Bertie had fallen to the ground and tried to crawl away. However, her injuries were too severe. Donald dragged her by her legs over to a shallow grave near where he had previously buried Janet. He turned Bertie over, lifted her up by her hair, and slit her throat. Now, Donald described burying Eddie as being much more difficult than he anticipated because according to him, he claimed that Eddie's injuries were far more severe and that when he was dragging Eddie to the shallow grave, that some of Eddie's intestines were falling out along the way and that he had to go back and collect them and put them into the grave. Donald then spent some time cleaning up the crime scene and headed back to Charleston. In October 1973, Donald killed Jackie Friedman. Jackie was a 14-year-old runaway from Minnesota, and when Donald met Jackie, he initially lured her into his car by saying that he would drive her to Myrtle Beach, but instead, he drove her to an abandoned house in Prospect, North Carolina. Now, the house had no electricity or water, but Donald had a lantern and flashlights. When they got there, Donald forced Jackie to remove all of her clothing before tying her up and and gagging her and then putting her body in the trunk of his car. Donald then went to a grocery store where he purchased food and drinks for the two of them that weekend and then drove back to the house where he kept Jackie alive for two days, torturing her the entire time by cutting off pieces of her skin, cooking them over a fire, and then eating them. After two days, Donald then drove Jackie out to a swamp, slit her throat open, and then buried her in a shallow grave. In December of 1973, Donald murdered Doreen Dempsey, who was 22 as well as her two-year-old daughter, Robin. In his autobiography, Donald claims that this was the hardest murder for him to talk about. Donald had known Doreen from knowing her stepfather for quite some time. Earlier in this case, I told you that Donald had worked at a carnival and Doreen's stepdad and his whole family was all involved in the carnival business as well. So that is how the two of them met. So they had known each other for quite some time and they did get pretty close. Doreen 
Maureen would come and stay with Donald and his wife from time to time when she would get into fights with her parents. And on one evening in December of 1973, Doreen and Robin went over to Donald and his wife's home. And you might be sitting here wondering, as I'm saying Donald's wife, who Donald's wife is. It should be noted that there really isn't much information out there about her because Donald had many, many marriages over the course of his life. He had about five or six different wives and his marriages never really lasted very long. But regardless, he was married multiple times. However, there really isn't that much information out there about those marriages, but he did have children with some of his wives. So he did have wives and he did have children. So on this night in 1973, Doreen and Robin went over to Donald and his wife's home. They went over for dinner on this particular night and Doreen was actually seven months pregnant at the time. And when she got there and started talking to Donald and his wife, she told them that she was looking for a place to stay and asked if she could stay with Donald and his wife. She claimed that all she needed was another two months until her baby was born and then she would be able to go elsewhere. However, she was really looking for somewhere to stay. Now, initially, Donald and his wife told Doreen that they really didn't have a place for them in their home only because their house was too small. They already had a child of their own and it was just going to be a little bit too much. So they weren't going to be able to accommodate her in that way. Now, a little while later, Donald was able to get Doreen alone and told Doreen that he did have a mobile home that he would allow her to live in rent free. However, there was a catch and the catch was that if Doreen Doreen and Robin lived in the mobile home for free. Doreen was going to have to be available for Donald for any sexual desires that he may have at any given point. Now, at first, Doreen was a little hesitant. However, she's hearing that she has a free place to stay for her and her daughter. So she accepts. Now, at this point, Donald told Doreen that he would even drive her over to the mobile home, and Doreen was very excited. She thought that this was the perfect opportunity, the perfect place for her and Robin, so she quickly gets into the car with Donald, and Donald told his wife that he was going to go drop them off at the bus station. So Donald really didn't want his wife to know anything about what was going on and just told her some excuse for why they needed to get out of the house. So Donald, Doreen, and Robin are now in the car driving to what Doreen believes to be the mobile home. Now, before we move further, I know I said it in the beginning, but I'm going to say it again. I'm putting a trigger warning right now for what we're about to talk about because it is absolutely horrific. Now, once the three of them were in the car, they began driving before Donald pulled over to the side of the road. Doreen asked what Donald was doing and Donald told her that he wanted her to perform oral sex on him, which she was hesitant about because Robin was in the backseat of the car However, Donald told her that she had no choice, so reluctantly, she agreed. While Donald and Doreen were in the middle of this act, Donald reached into the back seat and began undressing two-year-old Robin. This is when Doreen immediately stopped and asked Donald what he was doing, and in response, he took a hammer and smashed her over the head with it. Doreen then passed out unconscious onto the floorboard of the car before Donald picked up Robin and brought her into the front seat with him before repeatedly sexually assaulting and raping two-year-old Robin, ultimately choking her to death. Afterwards, he then dragged Doreen out of the car and slit her throat before burying her in a shallow grave with her daughter. Now, when Doreen's friends and family and Donald's wife started to notice that Doreen and Robin were missing and questions started to arise, Donald began telling everyone that he dropped Doreen and Robin off at a bus station and that he was under the impression that they were going to be going to Charleston to start a new life for themselves. And that was it. And again, this was able to be corroborated because Donald had told his wife that he was driving Doreen and Robin to the bus station. So she was able to confirm this because she had heard this before all of this had ever happened, before Doreen and Robin went missing. Now, I do want to point something out, and that is that after Donald was arrested and a part of his plea deal was telling the lawyers about these specific murders, he was telling them about Doreen and Robin's murder, but he painted a very different picture. Donald told his lawyers initially that he murdered both Doreen and Robin based off of his own racist motives and because Doreen and Robin were black. However, again, in his autobiography, he tells a very different story and he claims 
claims in this autobiography that he told a different story and that he did lie to his lawyers initially because he was trying to protect his own reputation. He figured that if he went into prison and everyone knew what he had done to Robin and how brutal her murder was, that he was going to be in a lot more danger himself because child molesters do not have the best reputation in prison, nor should they. And so he was worried and looking out for his own safety and basically covering his own ass on this. So that is what he stated as far as his reasoning for lying to his lawyers, because in his autobiography, he claimed that it had nothing to do with their race whatsoever. And I did want to mention that because as I was doing more research and looking more into other sources outside of the autobiography, more sources were claiming that, again, it was because of the racist motives. And so I just wanted to mention that before we continue. Now, this all brings us to 1974, and this was the year that Donald killed Jesse Ruth Judy and Johnny Sellers. Jesse Ruth was 22 years old and Johnny was 36 years old. Jesse Ruth was actually really good friends with Donald. Donald had introduced Jesse to her ex-husband before Jesse started dating Johnny. Johnny and Donald started working together on the stolen car business, so they had gotten to know each other pretty well. But over time, Johnny began owing Donald some money, and Donald was getting very impatient. One night, Donald ended up inviting Johnny and Jesse over to his trailer and told Johnny that he needed some help scaling a home to figure out how to rob it and asked if Johnny would accompany him out to this house. That way he could give him some tips and tricks. And Johnny agreed to do this. But instead of taking him to this house to potentially rob, Donald drove Johnny out to a dirt road before he got him out of the car and shot him. He then drove back to the trailer and told Jesse to get in the car, drove her out to the same spot that he killed Johnny at, and stabbed her to death. Now, not too long after this murder, did Donald murder another man named Horace Jones. Now, Horace was actually another good friend of Donald's who had apparently made advances at Donald's wife, and in return, Donald drove Horace out to a shallow grave, forced him to get inside of it, and then shot him three times before burying him. Now, when everyone started to question what happened to Horace and where Horace went, Donald told everyone that Horace was taking a bus up to New York to start a new life. And again, no one really questioned it. So now we're in 1975. In 1975, Donald describes this year as his busiest kill year to date. He started off with a coastal kill, murdering three friends, two girls, and a boy. Then in February of 1975, Donald killed Silas Barnwell Yates. Silas was 45 years old, and he was known as a wealthy landowner who was married, but having an affair at the time. Now, the woman that he was having an affair with was named Suzanne, and Suzanne was getting all of these very lavish gifts from Silas. However, one day, Silas took back all of the gifts from Suzanne, which in turn made her very angry, and that is when she decided that she was going to hire a hitman to kill Silas, and that is what eventually led her back to Donald. Donald got paid about $1,500 to kill Silas. Silas recruited a woman named Diane and told told her that he needed help in baiting Silas to get him out of his house, which Diane agreed to do. On the early morning hours of February 13th, 1975, Donald and Diane drove out to Silas's home and Diane went up to the front door. And when Silas answered, she told him that she was having car troubles and asked if he could help fix it. He agreed and began walking towards the car, not knowing that Donald was waiting for him behind it. Donald immediately jumped out and grew grabbed Silas by his jacket collar, and that is when Diane put handcuffs on him. They then drove him out to the spot that Donald had dug up a shallow grave at and stabbed him several times before slitting his throat and burying him. Now, shortly after this in April, Donald ended up murdering another
another woman, but this time, this was one of his best friend's wives, a woman named Diane Neely. Now, Diane was the wife of Donald's best friend, Walter, and Walter was also an ex-con. He was very much involved in a lot of illegal activity, and if there was anyone who knew about Donald and his murders, it was Walter. Donald gave Walter a little bit of information as far as what he had been doing, the kills that he had been committing, where he had been burying these bodies. So Walter was familiar with what was going on. However, again, he himself was involved in a lot of illegal activity, a lot of criminal activity. So it wasn't outlandish to him. He really didn't pay much mind to it. However, over time, Diane started to get wind about what was going on with Donald. And it's not clear exactly what she knew or how many details that she knew, but she ended up finding out about the murder of Silas specifically, and that was through her husband, Walter. Now, on one night in April, Donald was having a little bit of a house party. He was having some people over, and at the end of the night, Diane Neely ended up showing up to this house party. After everyone left, Diane and Donald had a little bit of a conversation where Diane told Donald that she knew about the murder of Silas, and if he wanted her to keep her mouth shut, he was going to have to give her $5,000 or else she was going to go to the police. Now, Donald was very much taken aback by this threat and knew immediately that he had to kill Diane. At first, he told Diane not to worry that he would give her the money and told her to meet him tomorrow at the same spot that he had been burying a lot of his victims. However, Diane did not know that. Now, the next day, Donald drove out to the location, and that is where he met Diane, as well as her friend that she brought with her, named Avery. Donald ended up getting into their car and instructed them on where he was hiding the money. He painted this picture that he had all this money buried underground, in this specific spot and was telling them where to drive in order to get there. So he's in the back of the car instructing them on where to drive and that is what they do. The three of them got out of the car at Donald's instruction and began walking over to where Donald said he was keeping the money. However, instead, that is when he pulled out a gun and shot both of them and then placed them into a shallow grave and covered their remains. Now, Donald was actually able to use his stolen car business to his advantage at this point because he was able to use their car that they were driving, Avery and Diane's, and refurbish it and sell it before anyone ever questioned what happened to Diane. Diane. And once questions did start to arise about what happened to Diane, Donald was telling everyone that Diane had met a new guy and that they had run off together to start a new life. And that was that. And again, no one questioned it. In the summer of 1975 is when Donald then killed his next victim, 13-year-old Kim Gelkins. Kim was a neighbor of Donald's and had been over to his house several times. All of the families in the neighborhood were very close. They would have little neighborhood get-togethers and neighborhood parties where all of the children would get together, including Donald. Now, it was several weeks leading up to the murder of Kim when Donald began sexually abusing her. During Labor Day weekend, there was a neighborhood party for all of the kids, and Donald was in attendance. He went up to Kim and asked Kim if she would want to accompany him on a trip back to Sumter for the weekend to see his daughter and his grandkids. He really painted this idyllic picture for Kim that she would be able to run around with other kids. It would be fun for her to get out of the house and do something, and she could hang out with all of these kids and it would be so great and Kim agreed to do it however made Donald promise that he was not going to sexually assault her during this trip and Donald promised. So the two of them then packed up and drove out to Sumter where it did not take Donald long to break this promise. One night while in Sumter when everyone else was gone, Donald grabbed Kim, held her down to the ground, and handcuffed her. He then took her to his bed where he repeatedly sexually assaulted her before going out to his car and grabbing a plastic tarp that he brought inside, placed on the floor, and placed Kim on top of. He then proceeded to 
burn her body and cut her up as well. And this was something that Donald actually referred to as carving. He said that he was carving her body. He tortured Kim until she was unconscious. And then when she woke up, tortured her more before ultimately strangling her to death. Now, Donald told Kim's friends and family that Kim ran away to start this brand new life, and there were a lot of questions surrounding Kim's disappearance. There was a lot of people that didn't believe that Kim just up and moved away. They thought that she was only 13 years old. She had never given any indication that she wasn't happy or that she wanted to start a new life. So there were a lot of questions regarding Kim's disappearance. However, there really wasn't any evidence in the very beginning to prove that something else had happened to her. So when Donald returned back to Charleston alone, he got back into his auto shop and that is when he saw that someone had actually stolen a car and a pickup truck from his auto garage. And this obviously enraged Donald. He was incredibly upset about this, but he did have a good idea of who he believed to have been responsible for this. And that was a man named Dennis Bellamy. And Dennis Bellamy was actually the brother of Diane Neely, the victim that we had just spoke about. Now, Dennis and Donald had met through Diane, and he had also met Diane's half-brother, Johnny Knight, in the process. Dennis was 27 years old, and Johnny Knight was 15 years old. Now, the reason that Donald believed that Dennis and Johnny were responsible for this was because Donald owed Dennis some money for some stolen guns that he had taken from Dennis not too long prior. So that is what gave Donald the idea that Dennis really was the only one who had a motive for this. Now, Donald ended up calling Dennis and told Dennis that he would give Dennis back the guns if he just met him in the woods behind his home, and Johnny and Dennis agreed to do this. Johnny and Dennis met Donald thinking that they were going to get the guns back. However, they were both murdered instead. Donald shot both Dennis and Johnny in the back of the head before burying their bodies in shallow graves. Now, I do want to return back to Kim Gelkins for a minute because as I mentioned earlier, there were a a lot of questions surrounding Kim's disappearance. There were a lot of people who did not believe that Kim just decided to run away. It just was not like her. So because of this, Kim's family really stepped in and got involved and her dad actually drove out to Sumter with police and searched Donald's mobile home. Now this was an illegal search, but they did it anyways because Kim's dad was not buying the story that Donald was telling. Now once they were searching Donald's mobile home, Home, that is when they found some of Kim's clothes inside of it. The clothes were in the bedroom closet of the mobile home. And while this really didn't prove anything, it didn't prove that Donald was responsible or that Donald actually did anything to Kim. This really gave Kim's family the motivation and the belief that Donald knew more than what he was saying. Now, after this finding, police really wanted to speak more to Donald about this. However, no one knew where Donald was. Donald was really Really good at hopping around from place to place, whether that was Charleston or Sumter or the country house. He was always somewhere. He was constantly rotating and that was on purpose. It was very calculated for why he was doing that. So no one really knew where Donald was or how to get in contact with him. However, what they did know was where Walter Neely was. And again, Walter Neely was Donald's best friend. Now, again, Walter was aware of a lot of the murders that Donald had committed. And if there was one person who knew about these murders, and if there was one person that police were going to be able to speak to, it was going to be Walter. Walter was the vault to all things Donald. But to no surprise, when Walter spoke to police, he initially claimed that he did not know anything about Donald and what he had been doing or Kim or the murders. He just basically denied knowing anything and claimed that Donald probably just needed to skip town for a little bit for whatever reason, but he would ultimately be back. Now, Walter did end up calling Donald after this initial conversation with the police and told him what was happening and told Donald that the police were really starting to crack down on him. And this is when Donald decided that he needed to skip town once again. However, luckily the police were able to catch up with Donald and caught him getting inside of a taxi. So they pulled over the taxi and were able to finally arrest Donald. Now, initially they were only holding Donald for the murder of Kim. All of this was because of the murder of Kim. It really had nothing to do with the other murders yet because police did not know what they were dealing with. They only thought that Donald was responsible 
responsible for Kim's murder at this time and their smoking gun were the clothes in the trailer. But Donald was very confident that he was going to be able to get out of this because in his mind, he felt like these clothes, while they were in his trailer, it didn't necessarily mean that he killed her. It didn't show proof that Donald murdered Kate. So he was pretty confident that he was going to be able to get out of this and he more than likely might have been able to do that. However, three weeks after his arrest, while he had been in jail, Walter Neely finally confessed to knowing about the killings that Donald had told him about. He told police about the murders of Johnny and Dennis and then continued to tell them about the graveyard of people that Donald had buried in his backyard. It is believed that the turning point for Walter in this case and what really made him confess was when police told Walter that Donald had murdered Diane Neely. Now, it's believed that the real turning point for Walter and what really made him confess to what Donald had been doing is when police told Walter that Donald murdered Diane Neely. And at that point, police didn't necessarily have the confirmation of that. However, by putting two and two together of everything that they're starting to gather and all of the information that they're starting to know, that is the seed that they planted into Walter's head. And that is what really made him turn on Donald. Now, Donald did end up taking a plea deal, and a part of this plea deal was taking police to the different grave sites of the bodies that he had buried, and that is what he did. However, he was very selective and choosy with which bodies he showed police and what murders he confessed to. He was very selective with it. Like I said earlier, he twisted the story about Doreen and Robin's murder because he wanted to protect himself going into prison. He also was selective about Janice as well. He actually took police to Jackie's gravesite and told police that it was Janice's body because he didn't want police to find the other bodies that were surrounded with Janice as well. So he took them to Jackie's burial site, which really didn't have any other body surrounding it. It was just her shallow grave singularly. So he was very calculated and selective with who he was choosing to show to police. On May 24th, 1976, Donald Gaskins was sentenced to death. And while he was in court, he said, quote, there are quite a few more bodies that have never been mentioned, but you've got enough for now. End quote. Now, in November of 1976, the death penalty was actually ruled unconstitutional in South Carolina. However, it was reinstated in 1978. On September 2nd, 1982, Donald killed another man inside prison. He was another inmate named Rudolph Tyler. Now, it wasn't until after Donald was put away and on death row that he claimed that he killed anywhere between 100 and 110 victims. Now, as I said, in the beginning, people do have a hard time with this because some people believe that he is just bragging and it is his sick and twisted mindset where he actually gets some sort of fulfillment and enjoyment, you know, fabricating and embellishing all of these different murders. However, there are some people, including his family and more specifically his daughter, who do claim that they believe that Donald did in fact kill all of these people and did everything that he said that he did. Now, Donald's execution was on September 6th, 1991 at 1 10 AM in the electric chair. Donald had always been really deathly afraid of the electric chair. He had talked about it a lot in his autobiography. He would say certain things to police in order to lessen his chances of getting the electric chair. He really tried to do everything that he could to not get the electric chair. However, ultimately, that is what he got. Hours before, he actually did try and kill himself to avoid the chair. However, he did not succeed. And his last words were, quote, I'll let my lawyers talk for me. I'm ready to go, end quote. That, you guys, is the case of Donald Gaskins. Like I said in the beginning, this is a wild case. It is a brutal case. It is a tragedy that Donald was able to get away with so many murders quite simply by just saying that all of these victims wanted to go away and start new lives. Like this seemed to be a repetitive thing that he kept telling people and a lot of people just kept believing it because there wasn't a lot of evidence to prove otherwise. He was incredibly calculated. He was incredibly manipul manipulative. He was incredibly vindictive and he was an absolute evil 
and monstrous human being. I think it, again, was so devastating that he probably could have been caught a lot earlier had people just, you know, started to look and read between the lines a little bit. I think that maybe there were other people out there that did know that just maybe did turn the other way. Again, his friends, that's a perfect example. Specifically, Walter Neely was aware of what he was doing. However, never said anything until the very end of it. But I'm very interested to hear what you guys have to say about this one. And with that being said, you guys, that is all for me today. Thank you guys so much for tuning into another episode of Killer Instinct. Again, if you're new here, hi, my name is Savannah. I'm your host of Killer Instinct. Make sure you go ahead and hit that subscribe button. That way you never miss an episode. We post weekly on the podcast every single Wednesday. You're not going to want to miss it. I'll be back next week with a brand new one for you guys. And until then, stay safe. Bye guys.